Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another Gung Fu workout. This is the 20th class I've done of these. Um, today, we're going to mix up a bit and base our workout off of the Brazilian martial art Capoeira, which is one of my personal favorites. I've been doing it for about 20 years now. So we're going to do our Kung Fu hips to get nice and loose, and then into some Capoeira basics. Hopefully, we'll go slow enough that you can all follow along. Take care, everyone. Tutorial organs and cords would rather be too severe than too lax. This is because treating you too severely would just be a mistaken method, but treating you too laxly would be a mistaken political direction. Ultimately, however, the decision belongs to the Military Control Commission. Of course, I'm telling you all this off the record. Chang's associate added, Representative Chang is trying to save you. Three witnesses have already signed. Your refusal to sign is pretty much meaningless. Change direction. I must urge you not to be confused here, yeah, Wenxia. Right, Wenxia. Chang continued. It would break my heart to see an educated young person like you ruined by something like this. I really want to save you. Please cooperate. Look at me. Do you think I would hurt you? Yeah, did not look at Representative Jack. What was she back saw forward. instead was her father's blood. Representative Cheng. I have no knowledge of the events recorded in this document. I cannot sign it. Cheng Li Hua became quiet. She stared at Yeah for a long while, and the cold air in the cell seemed to solidify. Then she slowly put the document back into her briefcase and stood up. Her kind expression did not disappear, but was set on her face like a plaster mask. Still appearing kind and affectionate, she walked to the corner of the cell where there was a bucket for washing. She picked it up and poured half the water onto Ye and the other half onto her blanket, her movements never straying from a methodical calmness. Then she dropped the bucket and left the cell, pausing only to mutter, You stubborn little bitch. The head of the detention center was the last to leave. He stared coldly at Ye, soaked through and dripping, shut the cell door with a bang, and locked it. Through her wet clothes, the chill of the inner Mongolian winter seized Ye like a giant's fist. She heard her teeth chatter. But eventually, even that sound disappeared. The coldness penetrated into her bones, and the world in her eyes turned milky white. She felt that the entire universe was a huge block of ice, and she was the only spark of life within it. She was the little girl about to freeze to death, and she didn't even have a handful of matches, only illusions. The block of ice holding her gradually became transparent. In front of her, she could see a tall building. At the top, a young girl waved a bright red banner. Her slender figure contrasted vividly with the breadth of the flag. It was her sister, one sure. Ever since her little sister had made a clean break with her reactionary academic authority family, when Sia had heard no news about her, she had only learned recently that when Shua had died two years ago, in one of the wars between Red Guard factions. As Ye watched, the figure waving the flag became Bai Mulin, his glasses reflecting the flames raging below the building. Then it turned into Representative Cheng, then her mother, Xiao Lin, then her father. The flag bearer kept on changing, but the flag waved ceaselessly, like a perpetual pendulum, counting down the remainder of her short life. Gradually, the flag grew blurry. Everything grew blurry. The ice that filled the universe once again sealed her at its center. Only this time, the ice was black. Three. Red Coast One. Yet yeah, when Sia heard a loud, continuous roar, she didn't know how much time had passed. The noise came from all around her. In her vague state of consciousness, it seemed as though some gigantic machine was drilling into or sawing through the block of ice that held her. The world was still only darkness, but the
the noise grew more and more real. Finally, she was certain that the source of the noise was neither heaven nor hell, and she remained in the land of the living. She realized that her eyes were still closed. With an effort, she lifted her eyelids. The first thing she saw was a light embedded deeply in the ceiling. Covered by a wire mesh that seemed designed to protect it, it emitted a dim glow. The ceiling appeared to be made of metal. She heard a male voice softly calling her name. You have a high fever, the man said. Where am I? When Sia's voice was so weak that she couldn't be sure it was her own. The right hip, external rotation. Yeah, felt weak. She fell back to sleep. As she dozed, the roar kept her company. Before long, she woke again. Now the numbness had disappeared and the pain reasserted itself. Her head and the joints of her limbs ached and the breath coming out of her mouth felt scalding hot. Her throat hurt so much that swallowing spittle felt like it was a piece of burning coal. She turned her head and saw two men wearing the same kind of military coat that Representative Chang had worn. But unlike her, both of these men had on the cotton cap of the PLA, a red star sewn onto the front. Their coats were unbuttoned, and she could see the red collar insignia on their army uniforms. One of the men wore glasses. Yeah, discovered that she was That's covered it. by a military coat as well. The clothes she was wearing were dry and warm. She struggled to sit up, and to her surprise, succeeded. She looked out the porthole on the other side. Rolling clouds slowly drifted by, reflecting the dazzling sunlight. She pulled her gaze back. The narrow cabin was filled with iron trunks painted military green. From another porthole, she could see flickering shadows cast by the rotors. She was indeed on a helicopter. You'd better lie back down, the man with the glasses said. He helped her down and covered her with the coat again. Yeah, Wincia. Did you write this paper? The other man extended an open English journal before her eyes. The title of the paper was The Possible Existence of Phase Boundaries Within the Solar Radiation Zone and Their Reflected Characteristics. Figure eight. He showed her the cover of the journal, an issue of the Journal of Astrophysics from 1966. Of course she did. Why does that even need to be confirmed? The man wearing glasses took the journal away and then made introductions. This is political commissar Lei Tzu Cheng of Red Coast Base. I'm Yang Weining, base chief engineer. It'll be an hour before we land. You might as well get some rest. You're Yang Weining? Yeah, didn't say anything, but she was stunned. She saw that he kept his expression calm, apparently not wishing to let anyone else know that they knew each other. Yang had been one of Ye Zetai's graduate students. By the time he had obtained his degree, Wenxia was still a first year in college. She could clearly remember the first time Yang came to her home. He had just begun his graduate studies and needed to discuss the direction right of his research with in Professor rotation. Yang said that he wanted to focus on experimental and applied problems, staying away from theory. Yet Wenxia recalled her father saying, I'm not opposed to your idea, but we are, after all, the Department of Theoretical Physics. Why do you want to avoid theory? Young replied, I want to devote myself to the times, to make some real-world contributions. Her father said, theory is the foundation of application. Isn't discovering fundamental laws the biggest contribution to our time? Young hesitated, and finally revealed his real concern. It's easy to make ideological mistakes in theory. Her father had nothing to say to that. Young was very talented, with a good mathematical foundation and a quick mind. But during his brief time as a graduate student, he always kept a respectable distance from his thesis advisor. Yeah, Wintia had seen Young several times. But perhaps due to the influence of her father, she hadn't noticed him much. As for whether he had paid much attention to her, she had no idea. After Young got his degree, he soon ceased all contact with her father. Again feeling weak, he had closed her eyes. The two men left her and crouched behind a row of trunks to converse in lowered voices. But the cabin was so cramped that Yak could hear them even over the roar of the engine. I still think this is 
isn't a good idea. Commissar Leg said. Can you find the personnel I need through normal channels? Young asked. Uh, I've done all I can. There's no one in the military with this specialization. I'm going out to you know, raise as many questions. You know very well that the security clearance needed for this project requires someone willing to join the army. But the bigger issue is the requirement in the security regulations that they be sequestered at the base for extended periods. What's to be done if they have families? Sequester them at the base too? No one would agree to that. I did find two possible candidates, but both would rather stay at the May 7th cadre schools rather than come here. Of course, we could forcefully move them. But given the nature of this work, we can't have someone who doesn't want to be here. Then there's no choice but to use her. But it's so unconventional. This entire project is unconventional. If something goes wrong, I'll accept the responsibility. Chief Young, do you really think you can take responsibility for this? You're a technical person, but Red Coast is not like other national defense projects. It's yeah. complexity is far beyond the and technical issues. You're right. But I only know how to solve the technical issues. By the time they landed, it was dusk. Yeah, refused to be helped by Young and Lay, and struggled out of the helicopter by... Change directions? A strong gust of wind almost blew her over. The still gyrating rotor sliced through the wind, making a loud whistling noise. The scent of the woods on the wind was familiar to her, and she was familiar to the wind. It was the wind of the greater Kingan Mountains. Forward, open and back. She soon heard another sound, a kind of low, forceful bass howl that seemed to form the background of the world. The parabolic antenna dish in the wind. Only now, when she was so close to it, did she finally feel its immensity. Yes, life had made a big circle this month. She Round was now on top and back. of Radar Peak. She couldn't help but look in the direction of her construction core company. But all she could see was a misty sea of trees in the twilight. The helicopter was carrying more than just yeah. Several soldiers came over and began to unload military green cargo trucks from the cabin. Okay, the cap went Jenga. Without glancing at her. As she followed Young and Lei, yeah, noticed that the top of Radar Peak was spacious. Opposite hand of A cluster of white buildings, like delicate toy blocks, nestled under the giant antenna. The trio headed toward the base gate, flanked by two guards, and stopped in front of it. Lei turned to her and spoke solemnly. Yeah, Vincia. Stepping out triangles. Of your counter-revolutionary crimes in controversy. The court would have punished you as you deserve. But now you have an opportunity to redeem yourself through hard work. You can accept it or refuse it. He pointed at the antenna. This is a defense research facility. The research conducted here needs your specialized scientific knowledge. Chief Engineer Young can give you the details, which you should consider carefully. He nodded at Young and then entered the gate after the soldiers carrying the trunks. Young waited until the others were gone, and indicated that Yash yeah, should follow him a little distance away from the gate, clearly trying to avoid the sentries listening in. He no longer pretended that he didn't know her. Lencia, let me be clear that this is not some great opportunity. I learned from the Military Control Commission at the court that although Chang Lihua advocates sentencing you severely, the most that you'll get is ten years. Considering mitigating circumstances, you'll serve maybe six or seven years. But here, he nodded in the direction of the base, is a research project under the highest security classification. Given your status, if you enter the gate, it's possible. He paused, as though wanting to let the base howl of the antenna add to the weight of his words. You'll never leave for the rest of your life. I want to go in. Young was surprised by her quick answer. Don't be hasty. Get back onto the helicopter. It'll take off in three hours. And if you refuse our offer, it will take you back. I don't want to go back. Let's go in. Yeah's voice remained soft, but there was a determination in her tone that was harder than steel. Other than the undiscovered country beyond death, 
from which no one has ever returned. The place she wanted to be the most was this peak, separated from the rest of the world. Here, she felt a sense of security that had long eluded her. You should be cautious. Think through what this decision means. Okay. Step. I can stay here for the rest of my life. Skiva. Young lowered his head and said nothing. And she Gina. stared into the distance, as though forcing Yan yeah, to sort through her thoughts. Yan yeah, stayed Skiva. silent as well. She pulled her coat tightly around herself and gazed into the distance. There, the greater Kingon Mountains were fading into the darkening night. What? It was impossible to stay out here much longer in the cold. Young began to walk what? toward the gate. He moved fast, as though trying to leave Yan yeah, behind. But Yan yeah, stayed close. After they entered the gate of Red Coast Base, the two sentries shut the heavy iron doors. A little ways on, Young stopped and pointed at the antenna. This is a large-scale weapons research project. If it succeeds, the result will be even more important than the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb. They came to the largest building in the base, and Young pushed the door open. Yes, saw the words Transmission Main Control Room over the door. Inside, warm air tinged with the smell of engine oil enveloped her. She saw that the spacious room was filled with all kinds of instruments and equipment. Signal lights and oscilloscope displays flickered together. A dozen or so operators dressed in military uniform were almost entombed by the rows of instruments, as though they were crouching inside battlefield trenches. The unceasing stream of operational orders and responses gave the whole scene a tense, confusing feel. It's warmer in here, Yang said. Wait here a bit. I'll take care of your living arrangements and return for you. He pointed at a chair and desk next to the door. Yes, yeah, saw that someone was already sitting at the desk. A guard carrying a handgun. I'd rather wait outside. Okay, next yes. up. Step. Step Young smiled at her card. From now on, front Jinga. you'll be a member of the base staff. Other than a few sensitive areas, you can go anywhere you want. His face suddenly looked uncomfortable as he realized another layer of meaning to his words. You can never leave here again. I prefer to wait outside. Yeah, insisted. All right. Young glanced at the guard at the desk, but paid no attention to them. He seemed to understand Yaz's concern, and brought her back out of the main control room. Stand somewhere out of the wind. I'll be back in a few minutes. I just need to get someone to start a fire in your room. Conditions at the base are a bit rough. We have no heating system. Yaz stood next to the main control room door. The huge antenna was directly behind her, and it blotted out half the sky. From here, she could clearly hear the sounds inside the main control room. Suddenly, the chaotic orders and responses ceased, and the room became completely quiet. All she could hear was the occasional low buzzing noise from some instrument. Then a loud male voice broke the silence. The People's Liberation Army 2nd Artillery Corps Red Coast Project 147th Transmission. Authorization confirmed. Begin 30-second countdown. Target classification A3, coordinate serial number BN20197F. Position checked and confirmed, 25 seconds. Transition file number 22, additions none, continuations none. Transmission file, final check completed, 20 seconds. Energy unit reporting all systems go. Coding unit reporting all systems go. Amplifier unit reporting all systems go. Interference monitoring unit reporting within acceptable range. We have reached the point of no return. Fifteen seconds. Everything became quiet again. Fifteen okay. seconds later, Next up, as a Cocavinia. crisis started to blare, a red light on top of the antenna began to blink rapidly. Begin transmission. All units continue to monitor. Yeah, felt a light hitch on her face. She knew that an enormous electric field had appeared. She lifted her face and gazed in the direction the antenna was pointing, and saw a cloud in the night sky glow with a dim blue light, so dim that at first she thought it was an illusion. But as the cloud drifted away, the glow disappeared. Another cloud that drifted into position began to give off the same glow. From the main control room, 
She heard more shouts. I'll find you with energy unit. Magnetron number three is burnt out. Backup unit is in operation. All systems go. Checkpoint one reached. Resuming transmission. Ia heard a fluttering noise. Through the mist, she could see shadows lift out of the woods below the peak and spiral into the dark sky. She hadn't realized so many birds could be roused from the woods in deep winter. Then she saw a terrifying scene. One flock of birds flew into the region of air the antenna pointed at, and against the background of the faintly glowing cloud, the birds dropped out of the sky. The process continued for about 15 minutes. Then the red light on the antenna went out, and the itch on her skin disappeared. From the main control room, the confusing murmur of orders and responses resumed, even as the loud male voice continued. Transmission 147 of Red Coast completed. Transmission system shutting down. Red Coast now entering monitoring state. System control is hereby transferred to the monitoring department. Please upload checkpoint data. All units should fill out transmission diaries. All unit heads should attend the post-transmission meeting in the debriefing room. We're done. All was silent except for the howl of the wind against the antenna. She ain't got watched as the remaining birds in the flock gradually settled back into the forest. She yeah. stared at the antenna and thought it looked like an enormous hand stretched open toward the sky, possessing an ethereal strength. As she surveyed the night sky, she did not see any target that she thought might be serial number BN20197F. Beyond the wisps of clouds, all she could see the stars of a cold night in 1969. Part 2. Three Body. Four. The Frontiers of Science. Forty plus years later. Wang Miao thought the four people who came to find him made a rather odd combination. Two cops and two men in military uniforms. If the latter two were armed police, that would be somewhat understandable. But they were actually PLA officers. As soon as Wong saw the cops, he felt annoyed. The younger one was all right. At least he was polite. But the other one, in plain clothes, immediately grated on him. He was thick-set and had a face full of bulging muscles. Wearing a dirty leather jacket, smelling of cigarettes, and speaking in a loud voice, he was exactly the sort of person Wong despised. Wong Miao? The way the cop addressed him by name only, so direct and impolite, made Wong uncomfortable. Adding to the insult, the man lit a cigarette as he addressed him, without even lifting his head to show his face. Before Wong could answer, the man nodded at the younger cop, who showed Wong his badge. Having lit the cigarette, the older cop moved to enter Wong's apartment. Please don't smoke in my home, Wong said, blocking him. Oh, sorry, Professor Wong. The young police officer smiled. This is Captain Shu Chong. He gave Shu a pleading look. Fine. We can talk in the hallway, Shu said. He took a deep drag. Almost half the cigarette had turned to ashes. He didn't blow out much smoke. He inclined his head toward the younger police officer. You ask him then. Professor Wong, we want to know if you've had any recent contacts with members of the Frontiers of Science, the young cop said. The Frontiers of Science is full of famous scholars and very influential. Why can't I have contact with a legal international academic group? Look at the way you talk. Sure, said. Do we say anything about it not being legal? Do we say anything about you not being allowed to contact them? <sighs> he finally blew out the lungful of smoke that he had sucked in earlier, right in Wong's face. All right, then. Please respect my privacy. I don't need to answer your questions. Your privacy? You're a famous academic. 
Wait, Shiv shouted. He waved at the young cop next to him. Give him the address and phone number. You can come by in the afternoon. What are you really after? Wong said, his voice now tinged with anger. See that? The argument brought the neighbors, curious about what was happening, out into the hallway. Captain Shiv, you say... Young cop pulled Shu aside and continued speaking to him in hushed, virgin tones. Apparently, Wong wasn't the only one annoyed by his rough manners. Professor Wong, please yeah. don't misunderstand. One of the army officers, a major, stepped forward. There was an important meeting this afternoon to which several that? scholars and specialists are invited. The general sent us to invite you. I'm busy this afternoon. No. The general already Relax spoke the head of the Nanotechnology <clears throat> Research Center. We can't have this meeting without you. If you can't attend, we'll have to reschedule. Sure, and the young cops said nothing. Both turned and went down the stairs. The two army officers watched them leave and seemed to sigh with relief. What's wrong with that guy? The major whispered to the other officer. He's got quite a record. During a hostage crisis a few years ago, he acted recklessly, without concern for the lives of the hostages. In the end, a family of three all died at the hands of the criminals. Rumor has it that he's also friendly with elements of organized crime, using one gang to fight another. Last year, he used torture to obtain confessions and permanently disabled one of the suspects. That's why he was suspended yeah. from duty. Wong Miao suspected that he was meant to overhear the conversation between the officers. Maybe they intended to show him that they were different from that rude cop. Or maybe they wanted to make him curious about their mission. How can a man like that be part of the Battle Command Center? The Major asked. The General specifically requested him. I guess he must have some special skills. In any case, his duties are quite restricted. Other than public safety matters, he's not allowed to know much. Battle Command Center. Wong looked at the two officers, baffled. The car they sent for Wong Miao took him to a large compound in the suburbs. Since the door had only a number and no sign, Wong deduced that this building belonged to the military rather than the police. Wong was surprised by the chaos as he entered the large meeting room. Around him were numerous computers in various states of disarray. They had run out of table space and put a few workstations directly on the floor, where power cords and networking wires formed a tangled mess. Instead of being installed in racks, a bunch of routers were left haphazardly on top of the servers. Printer paper was scattered everywhere. A few projector screens stood in various corners of the room, sticking out at odd angles like gypsy tents. A cloud of smoke hovered over the room. Wong Mao wasn't sure if this was the Battle Command Center, but he was sure of one thing. Whatever they were dealing with was too important for them to care about keeping up appearances. The meeting table, formed by pushing several smaller tables together, was piled with documents and odds and ends. The attendees, their clothes wrinkled, looked exhausted. Those wearing ties had all pulled them loose. It seemed as if they had been up all night. A major general named Chung Wei Si presided over the meeting, and half the attendees were military officers. After a few quick introductions, Wong found out that many of the others were police. The rest were academics like him, with a few prominent scientists specializing in basic research in the mix. He also found four foreigners in attendance. Their identities shocked him. A United States Air Force colonel and a British Army colonel, okay. both now, NATO officers, as well as two CIA officers, apparently right. acting as observers. On the faces of everyone around the table, Wong could read one sentiment. We've done all we can. Let's fucking get it over with already. Wong Miao saw Shu Tiong sitting at the table. In contrast to his rudeness yesterday, Shu greeted Wong as Professor. But the smirk on Shu's face annoyed Wong. He didn't want to sit next to Shu, but he had no choice, as that was the only empty seat. The already thick cloud of cigarette smoke in the room became thicker. 
As documents were distributed, Shu moved closer to Wong. Professor Wong, I understand you're researching some kind of new material? Nano material, Wong answered. I've heard of it. That stuff is really strong, right? Do you think it could be used to commit crimes? As Shu's face was still half smirking, Wong couldn't tell if he was joking. Because of your poor record, 
You had already been suspended for several months, and you are about to be expelled from the force. I asked for you because I value your experience in city policing. You should treasure this opportunity. Sure, continue to speak roughly. So, I'm working in the hope of redeeming myself by good service? I thought you told me that all my techniques were dishonest and crooked. But useful. Chung nodded at Shu. All we care about is if they're useful. In a time of war, we can't afford to be too scrupulous. We can't be too fastidious. A CIA officer said, in perfect modern standard Mandarin, we can no longer rely on conventional thinking. The British colonel apparently also understood Chinese. He nodded. We are not to be, he added in English. It's a matter of life and death. What is he saying? Xu asked Wong. Nothing. Wong replied mechanically. The people before him seemed to be speaking out of a dream. Time of war? Where is this war? He twisted to look out one of the floor-length windows. Through the window he could see Beijing in the distance. Under the spring sun, cars filled the streets like a dense river. On a lawn, someone was walking a dog. A few children were playing. Which is more real? world inside or outside these walls. General Chung said, Recently, the enemy has intensified the pattern of attacks. The targets remain elite scientists. Please begin by taking a look at the list of names in the document. Wong took out the first page of the document, printed in large font. The list seemed to have been generated in a hurry containing both Chinese and English names. Professor Wong, as you look through these names, does anything strike you? General Chung asked. I know three of the names. All of them are famous scholars working at the forefront of physics research. All right, that's the time we have. Thank you so much for watching. Um, yeah, if you enjoyed that capoeira, give me a reply or whatever is on the, on the um, YouTube comments and I can interweave that into future classes. Take care everyone and stay safe.